Welcome to the High Rise Podcast, presented by Headset, the leading data and analytics company for the cannabis industry. Emily, you know how some people use the term broccoli for weed? I've seen, uh, you know, Weed Maps did a whole segment where they used a mascot, a guy dressed in a broccoli costume. I think they called him Brock Ollie when they were talking about how hard it is to market cannabis. There's a magazine called Broccoli for cannabis enthusiasts. I think a lot of people use the emoji, you know, for cannabis. But it does seem like Aurora, the Canadian cannabis company, actually took that literally and went and bought a company producing broccoli. And that's what I wanted to talk about today. <laughs> it is an interesting directional shift for a cannabis LP. Yep, yep. So the headline is that Aurora, a longtime cannabis company uh, with, I think, roots in the medical space before adult use, paid $45 million, a Canadian, in cash for 50% of Bevo or Bevo, I'm not exactly sure how to pronounce it here. And they have a provision with another $12 million in Aurora stock could be paid, conditional on Bevo achieving certain financial targets. And uh, Bevo also agreed to buy a greenhouse from them uh, for up to $25 million. So I think they're getting a little bit of that money back. But I don't think this greenhouse in Edmonton is actually in use at this time from what I was reading. So Kind of an interesting direction, and, and I want to cover it. I mean, we've talked a lot about Canadian LPs. We've talked about how they've transitioned in many ways into alcohol companies with a model like Tilray. But this is an example of a cannabis flower company becoming an actual flower company. Yeah, so this is very interesting to me because when we've invested into cultivation in cannabis, when we've stress tested where the the low point of where the product could go on a wholesaling level is we've stress tested it down to like greenhouse or indoor grown vegetables. <laughs> so it's a very interesting shift to go from, you know, moving towards that higher, that moat that is created around a consumer product or an elk, Bev Elk to go t straight down to vegetables. And I did do a little dig. By the way, I do think the, the name is very interesting because the first before I put my glasses on and I read the headline, I, I was like, Bevo, Bevmo. <laughs> oh, I was yeah. like, oh, holy smokes. Maybe they're using some of that balance sheet to make a really big move. Then I saw what it was. And I then I started to think it's like Devo, the band. Like Devo, <laughs> so, that would be really cool. Yeah, yeah, actually it would. And like a good example of a company that went from growing at scale of tomatoes or mums would be Afria back in the day. And we invested into Afria before it went public. And one of the ideas behind that was that they were growing these things at, at scale and distributing them and working with large partners like Lowe's for the mums, those potted flowers. And they were able to achieve some level of success with that. So we thought, okay, if you shift into a higher margin product, which cannabis should be, that you'll only be able to shift gears higher. And so it was just, it's really interesting to see someone going literally 180 degrees in the other direction after having spent time in cannabis. I did think it was interesting too, that part of the deal was that Bevo was going to take over the greenhouse because I know that Aurora has basically, you know, what? A couple episodes ago, I think we were talking about funded capacity when we were talking about the product that got destroyed in Canada. And I think for Aurora, based on my assessment of the business, it is key for them to unload a little bit of the burden of their infrastructure on the cultivation side. So if they can pass this over to people who grow low margin products at scale, maybe that's a, a good trade off to be made. Yeah, yeah, it is interesting. And Afria is definitely a model. I know Copper State Farms uh, out in Arizona, uh, same kind of direction. Uh, Fife Simington has a history, I think, in Mexico with greenhouses and, and came and brought that model uh, to Arizona. So, it, you know, in that sense, it makes sense to me, right? I think that's a good thesis that it's, uh, you know, higher margin, less commoditized product when you move into this uh, cannabis world and have, have more parallels to things like CPG. But this is kind of the other way, right? Moving more into a commoditized world. I guess, you know, the what is it? Just because greenhouses, is that the commonality? The, the, the strange thing is that Bevo has been bought and sold before with Sun Farm Investments, which ended up becoming Zenibus, which ended up getting acquired by Hexo. And now I think is has some deal going on with Sundial. 
And uh, during that process, I think with Zinibus, they divested of Bevo at some point, maybe prior to the Hexo deal. So they're back out on their own. And then Aurora sees it and decides, hey, this is for me. And it sounds like it's re- related to cash flow, right? Like cash flow and just maybe making things look a little bit better. And I guess, again, the parallel is like, hey, we grow this, we can grow that. But I mean, fundamentally, you know, they do have brands, you know, and I want to talk about their brand, their brand data. They've got brands like Aurora Drift, Daily Special, Greybeard, San Rafael 71. And that's a very different model than the, like vegetables. You know, you don't really get, you know, branded vegetables and branded flowers in the same way. So, you know, in that sense, I feel like, do they continue on with, with the CPG model or do they look at more of like a commodity model and maybe just do production for other companies that have a CPG model? But then it just seems to kind of, in, in our world, you know, where you kind of you need those margins, you need to have those brands, I think. Maybe you can get some sort of scale, but even grows with scale, like Glasshouse in California that have that big greenhouse that they're doing, you know, have brands, around, their own brands, right? And they're using it for their own brands. They're not necessarily just just a wholesaler for other brands, right? So I don't know, just it feels to me like it's going to be a bit of a distraction for them and just a, a different business. And while it's cash flow positive here, I don't know if this is the right model. You know, we've seen the alcohol model. We see like Tilray becoming an alcohol company. And even that is different, right? And it kind of begs the question of like, what is a Canadian LP? You know, is it is it really like a cannabis company anymore? Or is it some other broader uh, term that, you know, encompasses cannabis and alcohol and maybe other things at the same time as a cannabis LP, also just a farmer, like a, a grower, like a producer of traditional like flour and vegetables. Yeah. And I, I know we were talking about it earlier, but Aurora has really not succeeded in creating an EBITDA rich company or even moving toward free cash flow. So it is very clear, especially when you read the way the headline is presented that that's what they're buying with this acquisition. And I did do a lot of thinking to, cause to your point, like moving more toward the commoditization, I mean, vegetables, there aren't a lot of vegetables that have created a brand profile, right? There's heirloom vegetables, which we know are grown in California or in these kind of like really high quality greenhouses in Mexico or Latin America makes a lot of sense also based on where they're located in the world in terms of getting closer to the equator, et cetera, et cetera. But then I started thinking about, you know, exactly the opposite of that. So you have coffee beans, which are a commodity, but are grown and put into packaging. And there's a whole experiential uh, aspect of building brands and coffee. Same thing with wine. Like if you, when you look back on actually the history of California wine country, before that it had been a large plum growing place and they were growing plums and distributing those and there was also apples and pears and things like that but then they figured out they could actually grow grapes and grapes go into wine and wine is a much higher product in terms of creating a moat around the value of it and as opposed to commoditization and then a couple others that are a little bit less fancy but have succeeded at this are citrus so you think about oranges Oranges go into orange juice and Tropicana has built like a really cool branded experience around this, but then it flows backward into the citrus area where they've identified regions where the best oranges come from, Florida, California, and and then it matters to the consumers. You actually have some kind of moat around that. And the same thing I would say is true for like cranberries where Ocean Spray created this whole relationship with you know cranberries in the northeast and like created a whole package around that and then you when you buy cranberries a lot of times not just are you buying ocean spray cranberry juice you're buying cranberries that have an ocean spray package on them so there have been ways that this has existed but I didn't when I was reading through Bevo's experience I did not get a sense of anything that was like special or unique around it it does truly feel like a wholesaling you know vegetable cultivator and The fact that it's kind of flipped in and out of a couple of these things, you know, I start to wonder if there's an identity crisis or if there's something going on in the business that it's just not that interesting to keep it going on its own. So it's just a really interesting set of circumstances. And then I do wonder to your question, does Aurora just become an agricultural holding company? and just ends up buying other agricultural properties that are throwing off some EBITDA, moving towards free cash flow, but it's really not about this high-growth consumer product uh, category that is cannabis. 
You hit it on the head there, right? It's cannabis is still so much opportunity. I think that Canada has been quite disappointing in the eyes of many people as far as what was expected. I mean, just the amount of um, you know money that these these companies burn. And, and that episode we did on all the the waste, uh, all the product that they have to destroy. You know, the overproduction. You know, for whatever reason, you know, it's not rolling out fast enough. The demand's not there enough. The regulations, whatever it is, I think uh, it didn't meet expectations. And, you know, to dilute it now longer term by being this kind of broader agricultural company, maybe is cannabis more of a distraction there, right? Because, I mean, it's still like the Wild West here with this stuff. And, and you got to be pretty nimble, pretty agile to really win in it. And I think if you don't succeed, it's just going to be really costly, as we've seen here. I mean, the people that that do get ahead, you know, are, are doing great. But the ones that that kind of flounder like this, that you know, just maybe have too much money to know what to do with it and just kind of end up burning a lot of it, you know, that, that continue, right, in, in this kind of world. So it, I just really want to talk about it because it is, it's fascinating to see kind of what's happened post-legalization, you know, a number of years on in Canada, federally legalized. You know, obviously, I think things like this will happen in the U.S. at some capacity when we see federal legalization here as well. There's going to be a, you know, a mass gold rush kind of mentality, a lot of capital pouring in, finding organizations that have some scale and really just overfunding them. And, uh, you know, maybe finding out that the demand isn't as high uh, there and then having to buy other vegetable companies. So maybe it's a good time to be a vegetable company. <laughs> Or a flower grower, maybe it's a good time to be a, an alcohol uh, company with you know some federal change on the horizon because it does seem like this is the inevitable path, you know, unless people can learn from what Canada did and you know try and apply apply their dollars effectively. Like these brands, just to kind of give you a sense of how they're performing in the market, uh, we have data on Aurora Drift, Daily Special, Graybeard, San Rafael, seventy one in British Columbia, Alberta, Ontario, and Saskatchewan here at Headset, and you know in those markets, Daily Special. Uh, accounts for about 50% of their brand revenue, you know, that we're tracking. So that's a pretty popular brand for them, followed by Greybeard. But I looked at just uh, kind of spot checked in Ontario, uh, given Ontario's, you know, where the population is, where the dollars are coming from, and the brands aren't, aren't performing particularly well. In July, it was a daily special was ranked number 44, and it moved down 36 places in our data. And so, you know, year over year, it's been a really hard year for them. And I don't know, you know, the story, if it's been the distribution or, you know, that brand is maybe performing in other provinces. I didn't like do this in every province, just kind of looked at the biggest province, but not really great for them. Greybeard is right after that at number 47 in the market. So very competitive, you know, for a brand of, of the scale that Aurora has to be so far down the rankings here. Year to date sales in, you know, Canada for us about 28 million for these brands, right? And I know they have other revenue streams and, and so on, but quite a long ways to go. So I understand, you know, they got to make some decisions. They got to look at where to put their money. You know, how are they going to grow the business? It's uh, competitive there in, in cannabis. And, you know, it's the San Rafael brand I know has been around since day one adult use. I remember seeing that before adult use came online. Some of these others, I think, may, might have come a little later uh, as they're looking for, you know, just how they diversify their their brands in the market. But San Rafael is like uh, almost the lowest at 11% of their total sales out of those brands. So, you know, it's been tough for them. And, uh, you know, this might be a good way to to shore up some of that those cash flows. And maybe they just move into the commodities business and, and kind of bail out on this or move some of these brands to others and focus on a different set of the business, you know, I don't know, hard to know. I'm not running the company, but it just, it seems like they've got to do something with, with the cash that they have and maybe vegetables and flour are where it's at and it's unique. And I like unique cause it's, you know, different than just going down the alcohol model, but hopefully, you know, it's part of a bigger picture, bigger idea uh, that they can move into. Yeah, I mean, from an investment perspective, Canada has been known for having a boom-bust cycle in a lot of different markets, and I think cannabis will have been just yet another one of them. And there is a ton of commodities trading background in Canada. And in fact, a lot of the shells that were used for the RTOs, the reverse takeovers, were old mining shells. And so it's just interesting that it, it could, you know, I'm just curious to think about how maybe it's returned to the roots of commodities and just focus on it like that. It's almost like a utility, but... Uh, you know, I mean, there are hops producers in, I think it's Eastern Washington is one of the large, right? Eastern Washington state has one of the largest yep. hops producers. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. someone's got to fuel 
the consumer products of the industry and but these guys are getting into vegetables so that's a d- departure but maybe yeah maybe they're just going to shift into becoming more of like i said an agricultural holding company focused on commodities and focused on you know ebitda they'll have a different profile in terms of multiples and expected return profile but maybe they'll be a little bit fundamentally more sound who knows and make a lot of good broccoli <laughs> i didn't see broccoli on the list <laughs> i don't think it is <laughs> different broccoli different broccoli thanks for listening to the high rise podcast presented by headset for more information on headset visit headset.io